Have you been really wanting to build out your social media, but you're not sure how to go about it, what content to create, how to break it down into different pieces and where to distribute it? If so, then this episode is for you. Today, I sit down with Steve Blank Jr., who is a marketing expert who breaks down into really digestible chunks how to create a piece of pillar content and how to cut that up into smaller pieces to distribute on all the different social channels. Now, if you find value in content like this, go ahead and hit that subscribe button now. And as always, I'm your San Francisco referral partner, Sean Kunkler. Steve, I'm stoked to be sitting down with you today. I feel like there's there's a lot for us to cover with regards to marketing, social media, and all that good stuff. But before we dive in, really quickly in a couple sentences who are you and what do you do absolutely appreciate the opportunity sean thanks for having me uh, excited to be here with you my name is steve blank jr i am a media and marketing professional um a philly native uh living in central florida now um my early relationship to media starts in you know teenage years uh, playing with uh, music and video production, early digital audio workstations, making beats, the likes thereof. Um, my introduction to the media side of things professionally starts early in um, uh, a newspaper advertising role in my early 20s. And uh, all of that to say those two realms have... Uh, fascinated me and driven me for such a long time that I've since found a way to kind of combine the two, continue to refine those skills. And uh, what I do today is offer media and marketing services to real estate agents and teams and various other uh, businesses and brands in different industries. But um, simply stated, I like to say if there's a, a story to tell, then I'm out to help individuals or organizations find a way to uh, do just that and build a community around it. Nice. I want to go back to one of the things you just shared. Did you sell ad space for a newspaper? I did. Yep. Ah, oh, kudos, man. I did that as well in my twenties and it was probably the hardest job I ever had. I, um, I feel your pain and <laughs> it was, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a bit of it for the world. Every bit of it was a grind to say that um, I was successful with that endeavor would be a, a, a full blown lie. You know, it was, it was super tough uh, to, to be, I guess, fair or, or to play devil's advocate to myself. I don't know that the best uh, framework was set around us, but before I go full PTSD in, into that uh, <laughs> ad space memory, um, I, would, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, yeah. The introduction to what it's like to have conversations with business owners about the psychology of the messaging. What, are we, what do we need to help people understand? What are they going to think in seeing or reading this? How do we want them to feel? How much money do I have to work with? How much space can I get? You know, what other bells and whistles, creating offers, things like that. So um, like an opportunity that I wouldn't have exchanged for the world, but it certainly didn't, uh, change my world while I was there. So to speak either. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I too have a little PTSD from it, but what I discovered from, from my experience is you're selling air and that's, it's an incredibly hard thing to pitch to a business owner is like you're, you're, you're buying this like ethereal thing. It's not very tangible. And I found that I have a much easier time selling tangibles, uh, an easier time selling homes or a product. Like if, if I can show you, if you can experience it with me, touch it, feel it, I, I have an easier time articulating what it is and selling it. And so that was my learning from that experience. And it that's was- That's very interesting. Yeah, that's, um, you're selling, a concept even if it is because when you said that immediately i'm thinking like all right sure i can't grab a bag of attention or order a dozen attention but i can i can quantify those things we can measure those things but no matter how you cut it 
when you package those measurements, all I have to offer you is that information through the air I breathe or at best what on a PDF or in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and even then it kind of feels like um, selling promises, right? Interesting. That's interesting. It's, I, I've never stepped back and contemplated social media or marketing in that same regard. And I don't know why I never drew those connections, but I feel with agents in this space, it's more about telling stories we're creating narratives, but I never viewed like posting something on Instagram as a sales pitch per se, but it is very ethereal. Like you're, to your point, you're selling, you're, you're, you're creating an environment to capture attention. And so ultimately that's the thing that you're sure, going sure. after. And I think it's important to complement that by saying, cause I don't want you or anybody watching or listening to, to interpret where we are so far as saying, aha, it's, it's, simply simply add space on the timelines like sure it absolutely is but on the other hand um social media is dynamically different and if it's not that to you then it doesn't have to be and it can be your journal you know you can never care sure. about having a single follower or a uh, person who you will be following it's just it is what you make it but in the world of you know business uh, marketing and advertising it is um, just that, but with algorithms. So <laughs> that's true. So when you sit down and you work with an agent or somebody who's been posting and doing a lot of social media, let me rephrase somebody who wants to do social media, what's generally the thing that's holding them back? What's the biggest roadblock that they have? Um, time and i would say i would have to tie that I, I know you want to isolate one but i would have to tie that with um a vision so if i had to say i've had ten thousand agent conversations you know i don't know if that's a number more or less um but if i've had that many then i would find that those two um they're not objections because it's not necessarily a sales situation we're talking about, but those two bits of red tape, those are the, the hurdles or the self-perceived hurdles that seem to uh, be, be there the most is, is uh, time and, and the vision. How do you address those or help somebody to kind of figure out how to allocate time and, and to create that vision? Sure. Um, one of the most effective ways, I think, to leverage time for content creation to create more social media. Um, when I'm when talking with you about social media, by the way, I'm talking largely about video, uh, mm -hmm. the pictures and the graphic elements. Great. And you can absolutely build brand with that to say that um, video isn't the most highly consumed medium of content that exists on the internet on planet earth would be a bold faced lie. So if you want to embark on that path, I would first um, come to grips with the fact or get excited about the fact wherever you are on the spectrum, yeah. that video is absolutely going to be a part of this program. And so with that, um, to get back to your question, how do we conquer time? I like to tell people, if you make the promise to yourself to make four videos this week, you have a few different options. One of them looks like establishing four different ideas, creating four different sets of bullet points, flushing those out into four different scripts, finding four outfits, four locations, and oh yeah, feeling good for separate days and times enough to get in front of a camera and do the thing uh, each week. Versus find opportunities to uh, be yourself and showcase your insights and expertise along the way in long form. So for instance, we'll sit down today and talk for 30, 45, 60 minutes. And throughout that, there will be bits and pieces where you or I or both of us showcase a little bit of who we are, what we stand for, demonstrate a little bit of what we've accomplished, what we're capable of, uh, where we're coming from. 
And within all of that, I don't have to think about a thing. It all comes naturally to me. So all that to say, one of the best ways to conquer the time issue, if you really want to dig your heels into content marketing and social media is batch content creation, whether that's at minimum sit down with your marketing assistant or intern or, you know, a cat that you've trained to hold up the camera, whoever is willing to do it in your world. Um, just run through some Q&A, get them done, batch them out to an editor like myself or anyone that you can find here or abroad. Um, so batch content creation, get it all done in one sitting so that you can go back to focusing on what it is you do best for the rest of the week uh, is the number one solution in my experience. And um, finding a vision, how do we overcome that is really just talking more about um, two lanes, I think, uh, of conversation, who we are and who we serve. And sure. I think the vision for the content itself um, kind of starts to take shape on its own as those questions get answered. I don't want to get too heady meta with you. It's not a, a therapy thing or depending on what types of strings that pulls on in your heart to be asked that type of stuff. Maybe it is a therapy thing, right? Because what we're talking about is brand but if you're not a kardashian then ultimately ultimately what that means is identity um and for a lot of people that takes a little bit of navigating some muddy murky stuff but within all of that is the answers to who i am what i stand for and therefore how i'd like to, to communicate uh, myself on the internet um and that kind of tells you what sort of questions to answer for your audience, things like that. Does that kind of make sense? It totally does. And it's, it's funny. I've done these drills with different people and I do find it's easier when you're, especially flushing out a brand to sit with somebody who's objective, especially if they don't know you, you're hiring them. They don't really, they maybe did a quick Google search, but they don't know you. They don't know you like your, your, your husband or wife or partner. And so they ask very different questions to kind of get to those pieces. And I found that's really helpful. Um, for me, I, I, I would say we can use this podcast, for example. The podcast is called Realtor 180. So it's helping agents to have a turnaround, a breakthrough moment. And so then the content is geared towards them. And then so that really helps shape and focus all every, all the questions, the direction. We know the audience, who's the actual end consumer. And then let's talk about things that are beneficial to them, things that keep them up at night, things they're worried about, and problem solve those. Right. Um, but it's hard because when, as an agent, and I'm sure you face this and hear this, there's no separation between the individual and the brand. Whereas Coca-Cola, or United or whatever it is, that's a, it's an entity and the CEO is somebody else. And they're not necessarily, the, they're not, they're just two different things. Whereas our business, it's all this commingled mess and there's no, there's no beginning. There's no end to Sean, the guy who works out, Sean, the guy who sells real estate, Sean, the guy who hosts the podcast. It's all just like this one muddled mess. Well, uh, so as an individual who is a self-owned one-player business, that being a real estate agent, state agent, absolutely. On the other hand, couldn't disagree more from a sense of, and I'm super excited to, to unpack this because I yeah, think let's... this goes up there with sharing that, that vi or clarifying that vision for your content. Um, way up there with that tide number one position that I gave you is the, I'm not an influencer. I don't want to put my life on the internet. And so I'm, I'm, I'm reminded deeply of those conversations. When you say things like there is no beginning and end to Sean, the man and Sean, the brand in, in the state of your being. Absolutely not. Because the man is the brand. The man is the business from the pers from the perspective of, Let's establish a content marketing campaign around Sean the man. We absolutely get to draw the line and saying, 
Sean's kids are never on screen. Sean's huh. spouse is never on screen. Nobody knows if Sean has either via the internet. Um, Sean doesn't post pictures of his meals, you know, whatever it is. And so there's this, um, this concern around one being vain or two being sort of required. Oh, that's fun. Thanks, StreamYard. <laughs> or what two. Was that? Uh, I, when you do certain gestures, it triggers. Uh, I learned that in Zoom the hard way. That's amazing. Um, we'll have to keep that in for people watching. They can, yeah, they can I'm experience. sure that. Hopefully that's not, I mean, that might be the visual <laughs> visual um, highlight of this all. But um, let's see, where were we? Getting back to... The separation of brand and person. Sure, yeah, yeah. To, to kind of bring that home, we get to pick and choose where those lines are drawn and I find all too often in those early conversations with people on different uh, aspects of this spectrum, the spectrum being folks who have been doing social media for a long time but want to turn it up or turn a corner and start to add more personal content to it. All too often there's this assumption that in order to do the personal brand content marketing social media game and apply that to my business, I now need to let everybody know where I am, what I'm doing, and who I'm with. And that's just not the case. Yeah, I, I actually, I appreciate the pushback on that because I agree. I have really close friends who have kids and well, they'll say that. Like my kids are never, I never want to have them on social. I have a good friend. She will only film her kids from the back. So like if they're on a hike, you'll only see the back of the kids. And so like that was her level of finding the comfort of mm -hmm. showing the activities with her family without exposing her family. And, and yeah, I, I agree. And I, I feel if an agent or somebody wanting to delve into social and they're not doing it, draw a line down a piece of paper. Like I will. Yeah. And then I yeah. won't. And then figure out those things that make you really uncomfortable and just don't do those. That's totally absolutely. Cool. And if, if I could, I'd love to take the example of your friend with the photos of the back only of their children a step further and say, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that if instead of the decision to shoot only the back of her children, she chose to never include her children at any angle, at any level, mm. we could still effectively demonstrate who she is, what she stands for, what makes her tick, what's her expertise, how can she serve you. She can be uh, effective and genuine and authentic without showing her children and this isn't a, yeah. uh, a a plea to to make that change for her but simply an example for those listening who hear that and say oh okay well i'll do that but my kids have to have a hat on low you know sure like draw the line wherever you might like in that capacity but also your kids don't have to be there your breakfast doesn't have to be there <laughs> um and you it can still be authentic to you and that's important to to, to yeah. recognize yeah that's again i think that's a really great great point and it, for me, what's interesting is doing, having these conversations, for me, super easy. I enjoy it. I love learning from people and understanding what they're doing. I have a, I have a genuine curiosity of humans and what they do to succeed on a massive level. And so sitting down and doing this, love it. But when it comes to me posting a picture on social media or doing a video, I find it very, it's hard for me because it feels very manufactured at that point. It's, it's like, to your point, I don't want to take a picture of my food. I, I don't want to show off my car or like, I don't want to be showy. So I try to avoid, I don't want to do photos or videos of, of things that I've, I'm enjoying, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I find it really hard to find cr content that I, I deem worthy. And so nine times out of 10 on my personal Instagram, it's garbage. I just don't, I, I find it a, a very challenging thing, but mm -hmm. repurposing pillar content like this, I'll do it all day long because I, I enjoy these conversations and I enjoy what you and other amazing guests have to say. And so I, I will repurpose that all day long. And so, yeah, I think there's a weird, there's a weird, um, stigma. 
not stigma. I don't know. Um, no, I, I want to say stigma. I think it's a good word, but it's um, it's just our own personal weirdness, I guess, is what it comes down to. Like getting how we want to be perceived. How we want to be perceived. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that's that that's another high level concept that's important if we're again if you're just getting started or if you want to turn that corner you know we we mentioned some Gary V concepts in our uh pre-production mastermind on the phone I would call it a call but it was quite long <laughs> um and one of those Gary V concepts is uh documenting versus creating yeah and so I would apply that to the idea of your personal brand um, and depending on where you're at in your life and in your career, one of two things will be true or somewhere along the spectrum, but you get to make the choice how you go about it. You can manufacture, like you said, or create a narrative that makes people think about you the way they, that you want people to think, that makes people feel about a certain way about you. Um, or you can be an active participant in the world, whether it's in real life or in internet forums or comments or chats, whatever it is, um, create value, mm -hmm. be a good person, have interesting conversations, make a point of it to meet new people. Hopefully the last two of those things fit this conversation. Yay, more balloons. <laughs> um, and document that right so when i talk about That's networking and creating value it's it's you're already doing things that deserve a platform like we've talked about yeah. um find a way to press that big red button whether it's turning your cell phone on in the room or getting somebody to have a conversation with you on zoom or riverside whatever it is um so yeah that's a, a big one that comes up a lot uh and for people who don't know gary v is basically the, the godfather at this point of social media, all things social, and built multiple companies, built himself as a, as a brand. Actually, he has kids and a wife who you'll never see on any of his social channels ever. And that was one of his hard stops as well. Yeah. Like he's yeah. like, I just I think I think he shared uh, like a story of hers or something that included him to his timeline or to his story. Like I just the other day, I've been I think I found out about Gary Vee in like 2015. For the first time in my entire life, the other day, I thought to myself, Gary Vee's got a lady. And, and I'm I sure I assumed that he would have, but it just never was a part of the things that were interesting and appealing to me about who he is. And so, like, I was just as much a fan knowing or not knowing that. So to your to our earlier point in talking about, like, where to draw the line, that's like he's doing just fine. And nobody knows what that man's kids look like. <laughs> exactly. I mean, he took to give people some context. His family had a wine shop, a liquor store on the East Coast. It was doing okay for that local local spot. And what he did was he created Wine Library where he wanted to make wine accessible to everyday people who prefer to drink beer. And so he created this library where he would sit down and, and taste a glass of wine, but he would talk about it like a normal guy. So he'd be like, ah, this... This one tastes like it's got hints of like gym socks or whatever it was. Tennis it was balls. Very... It smells like an, a freshly opened tennis ball can. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's pungent. Um, but in doing that, he built the company to a $30 million brand, which is staggering. And again, he was talking about a specific topic to a specific group of people and his kids and his wife and his personal life never had to, to cross that. Um, and I would actually stack within that as an agent, if you sit down and record for, if you just write, you don't even have to write it. You can go to really quick. Here's a, here's a really quick tip. Go to chat GPT and write, just type, what are 25 questions buyers have when purchasing a home? Mm -hmm. Print them out, hit record, and just answer, read the question, and then answer it. Read the question and answer it. Send the whole thing to your intern or your kid or to you, 
and just say, hey, chop this up into a bunch of smaller digestible pieces. And then you take all those, those little pieces and you do that, schedule it. It's not in your schedule, it doesn't exist. Schedule it once a week, build those up. And then when you start overlapping it, you're not wearing the same shirt in every single one because you can start overlapping from this week to the last week. And then it's all this brand new volumes and volumes and volumes of content around a topic that you're an expert. Yeah, I would I I would tell people to rewind at this point for the last 60 seconds, however the apps work, two minutes, whatever they have to do to get to the beginning of the explanation you just gave. And do not take it lightly. Do not take it with a grain of salt. Sean is not just cooking this up as he goes. That wasn't a freestyle idea. And if it was, I promise you, if you're having a hard time digging your heels in and you don't know where to start, um, that is the, I don't even want to say easiest because it makes it sound like, you know, it'll be bad content maybe that comes as a result. Like if you can be authentically yourself, perhaps you have to think a little bit ahead of time about what you want your answer to consist of so that you don't go on a three minute rant in a world where your video needs to be 60 seconds or less on various platforms. Um, get your thoughts together a little bit. And outside of that, like it's, there's work to it, but it's that easy at least to get started. Or if you don't have that person in your life, you can take those answers. You can take that file on your phone, crop it down to the beginning and end of your response. All of the social media apps have an auto caption feature. I guess what I'm saying is given what Sean just said and just the state of tools and technologies available to us today, especially the free ones, there's no excuse to not get started. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, we, we, we as humans love to make everything incredibly complex and it just doesn't need, it doesn't, does it doesn't need to be that complex. And I would say the other thing that really freed me up with doing this whole podcast is when I sat down and kind of wrote out my plan, I literally wrote at the top of the page, I will make 100 videos before I evaluate if I'm doing a good job, if this is working, basically freeing myself up to the point where I have a hundred chances to experiment on what's working, what's not, what do I enjoy? How do I engage with the guests differently? How do I keep them engaged? How do I extract the best that they have to offer? But I'm not even there. I have 70, we're at 70 recorded episodes. I still have 30 more to go. And so I'm in that mindset of this is just a process and it's not going to be perfect. And I go back and I cringe when I watch those first episodes. I'm like, oh my God, like I wasn't, I didn't find my flow yet. And that's cool. It's fine. It'll, people watching and consuming, they'll see that I've evolved over time. And that's, Do you, I think that's the part you have to give yourself grace. Yeah. You, you feel like, um, you personally have kind of, um, come a long way in that respect, or what would you say has been like the single, or if there's two and you have to tie them up like I did earlier, what would be like the single biggest lesson that you've learned as a podcaster? You know, not necessarily reflecting because we're not at that 100 mark, but just knowing who you are today when you get into these conversations, um, what's like the, the number one thing that's evolved for you since episode number one? Ooh, that's a great question. Thanks for spinning this this conversation on me. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No worries. Sorry. I selfishly, I'm like, ooh, I'm with another podcaster. You know, let's see. Uh, uh, what... I, you know what I think? I'll tell you my answer. You may or may not be surprised. Or you may, I, not, I, may or may I, not care and want to hear the answer, but we'll find out shortly. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I'm actually, I'm very curious of yours. And you're right. Tying it up into just like one or a small package with a bow on it is really, really challenging. But I would say the biggest thing that I've learned is to just kind of take it all in stride. Like even us trying to record today, we had a mic issue and we had a false star and it kind of, it took a couple reloading and back and forth. I, I used to get really tense and frustrated and like, come on, like, why isn't this stuff working? And now I just kind of don't give a crap. And so I've, I've, I've kind of leaned into, I'm gonna have a problem <laughs> and it's fine and we'll figure it out. There's, 
I've had ep- eight episodes, give or take, that I've had to completely scrap. They were 100% unusable for one reason or another. And the first time I had to send that email was actually to Leonard Steinberg and was like, hey, like, I'm really sorry, but the episode, there's this weird chatter. I have no idea why. And here's the episode. You tell me what you would like to do. And he gracefully said, it's not, it doesn't match both of our brands. And I would prefer to re-record. And I just... I, one, hold him in a very high regard for saying that. But after that, I realized that no one wants to put out something that's going to negatively impact their brand. And so just approaching people, honestly, saying, hey, like, I genuinely appreciate your time because I do. But the episode's pretty much garbage. Here's why. I would love to re-record with you. I'll clear my schedule. You just tell me when you want to meet and I will we'll move heaven and earth and make it happen. Um, and, and I, again, for the most part, people, when they realize that I have a standard and I want good for them, they're usually fine with it. So I would just say it, it was it, the, the biggest thing I learned was just to roll with the punches. Um, it's really, really. It. And then I think on a subtle level from a conversation perspective is to and I shared this with you earlier, if I sit down with a list of questions, I'm not really paying attention to your answer. I'm just waiting for my turn to ask the next question. Whereas today, when you said you worked for a newspaper, if I just had another question, I would have never have gone back and said, like, hey, tell me about that. Or I had this crazy weird experience. And then the conversation took a totally different trajectory because of it. And so I found the beauty in really actively listening has has helped me evolve this um, and I'm still working on it so that's my my as concise as I can two answers but I would yeah, love yeah. to I'm, I'm insanely curious now to hear what I think I may have your I may have shared are. with you a little bit about and it's pretty granular um, as a podcast host you know um, but when you're in those active listening scenarios, you want to be present. You're not, you don't have a list of questions. You're not thinking about the next question, but somebody gives you your next question within their answer. And so you're actively listening, but now you're hanging on to this little nugget and it's just kind of hanging over here and it's just flowing. You're like, get back here. Don't go. Cause I'm, I'm over here with you, but get, get back here. And God forbid, that happens again or two more times throughout the course of that person's response or throughout the rest of that exchange. Um, it's just not something that is natural conversationally. We let ourselves go, we get lost in different directions and eventually find ourselves saying to each other, how, how did we even get to talking about this? At which point, a lot of times you, you laugh about it amongst friends and say, oh man, anyway, moving right along, right? And so within the, the realm of podcasting, um, the same thing kind, kind of happens. It's often referred to as conversational threading, where these sort of tangential threads take place, uh, one off of the next. And I feel like since my first go all the way through and still learning in various ways, I think one of the things I could quantify being better at would be being able to stay present and absolutely listen while bucketing those questions, you know, throw, throwing those in my pocket, or as it relates, getting to that point with a guest and saying, man, how did we get here? We really had something we wanted to finish out before we started these six tangents. I've gotten a lot better over the years at um, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know, of getting to the, yeah. the first degree, <laughs> you know, and figuring out where it all started, so to speak. Um, so that's one little nugget. For me and then um, I just wanted to tie back to what you were saying sort of that led us into this part of the conversation and just before that which was um, giving yourself grace and how you measure yourself you talked about waiting until you get to a hundred I think that's an important big picture takeaway for everybody from a quantity standpoint it says 
even if it's in the realm of social media, if you make your first video tomorrow and it's an absolute flop, if you let that flop impact how you proceed with content marketing, you failed before you started. Good news is you can start over, so to speak, or, or keep going and, and choose to stay up. Um, so there's that in terms of quantity, not measuring yourself too quickly, you know, or in a world where you have a thousand followers, you make one post, maybe a hundred people see that and it doesn't go over really well. Don't overthink it. Um, as it relates, I think it's also worth sharing, like whoever you are, unless some massive fundamental change happens in your life, which doesn't necessarily need to happen for anybody or everybody, you are who you are. Your voice is how it sounds, you look how you look, barring little shave or, or coloring or a tattoo or whatever your thing is, none of that's changing. And as far as I understand at this point, you're gonna get one chance to ride this flying rock in space. So let it fly, you know? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a really great, it's always a great reminder is this is fine. And that's not to say like the hell with it all. You know, we all have room yeah. to grow and you will absolutely get better in ways of how you communicate yourself on the air or on video, but like how you look, who you are, what you sound like, some of these things aren't going anywhere. And the longer you hide from them, the longer you hide from um, your biggest asset. Yeah. You know, what's funny is you reminded me of, I've had a moment where this is true. This is recent. I literally, not no exaggeration, last Saturday, I spent the entire Saturday creating one video. Because when I podcast, the, the biggest problem I have found with most guests is they either don't have the right mic, they don't have the right camera, they don't have the right lighting, and they, basically they don't have the right setup. And so that... How did I do? Great. I mean, aside from the mic, don't, we don't know. <laughs> great. This is not your first rodeo. So you did great. <laughs> um, but, but a lot of my guests, they've just never podcast, so they don't know the basics. So what I did, what I decided to do is create this really amazing video on here's the gear. I outlined it all, how to set it up, like the whole nine yards. But I spent the whole day writing out the whole script and then sitting down and recording it and recording it in two places and then doing all the edits. It, I'm not exaggerating. It took me all day, like a 10 hour day to edit, put it all together, add the, the different effects and super proud of myself. I have 38 views for all day worth of work, 38 views. I have another video, a handful of them. Like I do a, you do a reel or a short, you pick up the camera, you're like, hey, I'm about to walk in this really amazing property, blah, 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 and then you enter in. And that thing gets thousands of views. It takes me three, 30 seconds to film a video that I think is garbage, and it gets thousands of views, and then I, I try to create a masterpiece, and it falls flat on its face. And so my piece of advice, stacking onto what you say or shared, is just put, put it out there, because you just never, you never know what's gonna hit. So you might as well just put it all out there. Like, and there are variables, perfect. right? Like th this isn't print ad space like we talked about. So there are other variables. That's not to say that that video that you spend all day doing is a flop. If you post it, you know, if you finish that and you posted it Saturday afternoon, Saturday night when you were done, you did it Saturday night at six. We live absolutely in a world where if you do it Sunday at six, it could be a grand slam. Or if you do it Tuesday at 1 p.m., it could be a dynamically different result. So all of that to say, like, there are variables otherwise at play that determine whether or not that's a flop or a waste of time, you know, however you choose to interpret that, um, isn't just the content is something to be mindful of in, yeah. in this scenario in the digital landscape. And as it relates to the bigger picture of what we're talking about, I think it's important to recognize if you're the type of person that likes making that stuff, yeah. but you don't have time to make five of those a week or every two weeks, but you still need to press go and do something, do something like pillar content marketing, the pillar micro content marketing sort of strategy that we're talking about mm -hmm. that 
from an editing, how do I get this from being recorded to being ready to go social media content is, is it going to require time, energy, and or money? Absolutely. Um, but it won't be nearly what it was for that creative endeavor. So if you're in that scenario, stay creative, do your thing when you can and sprinkle it in so that you don't feel this, you know, the world of stress on your back because I haven't put anything out because everything has to be a creative edit, so to speak, yeah. you know? Yeah, and that's kind of what I was getting at is it doesn't have to be perfect. Like you don't have to have a perfect workout every time, but you do have to show up. And that's like, that's the important part that I, I feel like a lot of, again, we just get in our own way. We overthink things, we get in our own way. So let's, let's kind of go back and I want, I would love for you to unpack pillar content and then pillar micro content and what is scheduling and breaking out some of those more into the scheduling and what does that all look like? Sure. Um, so we start with pillar content. What is pillar content? It's the long form content from which all other elements for this strategy will be extracted. Um, sometimes it looks like a podcast recording. Sometimes, depending on who you are and what your occupation and lifestyle like, it's keynotes or moderating panels maybe you're on a team and there's a weekly team meeting perhaps you also do some coaching and you do coaching calls these batch opportunities to create some form of recording ideally a combination of audio and video so that we can repurpose as many ways as possible in long form so pillar is anything as long as it's the extended version if you will um, content in any duration is consumed in the form of pictures, video, written word, and audio. So then we ask ourselves, how can I take this recording of me on a coaching call or this podcast that I just started or that I'm, you know, uh, years deep into, how can I take that content and turn it into as many different types of content as possible. So how can I turn audio and video into written word, mm -hmm. transcription? How can I turn that audio video element into just an audio asset? Call a guy or use a free app. There's an easy way to do it, but it, it's easily done, right? Yeah. Um, how do I turn that video into graphic elements? Well, you could certainly pull screenshots from it and images, but what comes to mind more for me is I'll actively listen to that and I'll wait for a moment in that podcast where Sean says something that's like an absolute mic drop moment, that one sentence home run that he hit. I don't need to read or hear anything before it or after it. And I'll make like a quotable out of that in Canva or Photoshop, wherever you play around. It'll be a headshot or a lifestyle cutout or something like that. Sean looking like the badass that he is. And then that awesome quote that he delivered right next to him. Um, that's an example of how do I turn this audio video element into graphic elements. So I exemplify those briefly to just kind of help people you know, really understand what it looks like to turn that into audio, video, written word, and graphic elements. From then you basically ask yourself, where are all the places that these types of things live? I have a gang of quotable elements, graphic design elements that I made from our podcast. I have all these micro video clips that I found from these special little moments. I have the full length transcription, um, and I have these highly edited, professionally produced audio elements, what do I do with them? Mm. Fortunately, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of social and streaming platforms that can't wait to have your content in their pipeline. So your graphic elements are great for social media, for your website, building into an email newsletter, your written transcriptions are great for that same email newsletter, the blog section of your website, there are also social platforms like Reddit or Medium.com that are all but exclusively text-based. 
um, the audio platforms of the world, obviously, your podcasts, Amazon, Apple iTunes, Spotify, uh, video, YouTube, all that stuff. And then all those mini bits, the graphic elements, the uh, video clips support ongoing uh, drips, if you will, onto your social media. So if you can establish a process for identifying within a piece of pillar content all of the potential pictures, video, written word, and audio elements that exist within it, you've got weeks worth of content marketing for a variety of channels, things specific to your close sphere, like your email list, all the way out to people you show up on their explore page on TikTok, you can kind of set it and forget it um, at that point. That's amazing. Oh, and as far as distribution goes, you mentioned a lot about, you know, honing in on scheduling and distribution. Um, I find myself doing a combination of things I use later. Uh, I use the meta business scheduler and I do a lot of stuff manually. Um, long story, less long, all of these dashboard apps would like to be the one-stop shop, but it seems that for whatever reason, company A, B, or C, be it TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, doesn't offer the capabilities that you would want and need. Let me mute this, sorry. Um, so like Hootsuite, I think for a while when I started to use it, um, was incapable of publishing video to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Again, in a world where video is the most widely consumed type of content on planet Earth, that's kind of a problem for me as a marketer. Sure. So I end up sort of uh, doing a bit of Bruce Lee, so to speak, in, in terms of how I approach the, the style of distribution. And that is I'm pulling from a couple of different buckets and adding some of my own along the way, i.e. doing it manually. That's... um. Wow, that's so complex. But what I actually really like about that is it all just starts with one pillar piece of content. You just have one long form something, and then all of that gets chopped up and dispersed into all these other more digestible pieces for the different platforms. And that's where an agent or a team, that's where you leverage people. And you, the, the main person, just sits down to create this this one piece. Once it's created, your team or someone else can then jump in and start overlapping it and scheduling it and optimizing it and putting it out there. And then that's where it the that's where the force multiplier actually happens. And so putting on your schedule, I'm going to film like these podcasts, they take me an hour. I sit down with the guest for an hour and then that's literally an hour's worth of content that gets moved to the next person. And then it's all, it's all up and running. So that's a really, I, I understand like listening to it, how complex it sounds, but that's actually the easiest digestion I've ever heard to cut it all up. I hope so. You know what? In hindsight, listen, thinking about how I explained it, I'm like, you know what? I think even that might be too much. I just want to go back and like super dumb it down, so to speak, and say, make one long thing so that we can make as many different types of shorter things as possible and then identify all of the places that these shorter things can go and ways that they can be shared with the world and you're off to the races. I mean, it's a technical thing, but all too yeah. often in the space of technology and media and digital marketing, there's a lot of bombastic, verbose pontification and like, I don't want it to come off as, as that. And I also don't want anybody to have heard that and been like, ooh, that's a lot scary. It's like, no, go make a long thing, pay somebody to turn it into shorter things, go sell more houses. Come back, do it next week. I'll see you yeah. there. You know, <laughs> I, that's one hundred percent. Like you basically just summarized it in a really elegant way. Just, <laughs> just create a really, just create one. I mean, and, and the other, the, the beauty is, if they're videos, a hundred percent of agents have a smartphone in their pocket, and the cameras on the phones now are incredible. 
and it has the 100% the capability to create a really quality video for you. Yeah, and yeah. So can, can I can I add to that real quick go, to, go to speak it. to the agent community? That's a huge thing. Well, budget, I, I can't be paying these guys to come around once a week with all this fancy camera equipment, and I just, I don't have it. Nobody is requiring that for you to be successful in the modern media landscape. Everybody's got a pocket camera that shoots with some pretty awesome lens in 4K, 24 or 30 frames per second or whatever your vibe is you're going for. You've got industry standard film quality in your pocket. Um, so again, if it gets to a point where you want to have a fancy pants video shoot every once in a while and you had a big closing or, you know, whatever, it, it's in the budget once in a while, go for it. But in a world where that's the thing that keeps you from moving on at all in video creation, you have to really take a step back and like not take for granted the technology that's available to us and say, damn, you know what? If I just wipe the food off of this thing that's accumulated over the last couple of weeks from my cup holder or, you know, dust, makeup, whatever's on there, if I just give that a wipe, position it properly and don't stand in, you know, front of a open window. <laughs> um, exactly. I might have something to work with here. So yeah, don't take, don't take that for granted and don't let, uh, in no way, shape, or form, do you need to hire on-site video production one time or on a regular base to make successful True. video content. Yeah, and it goes back to the gym analogy. Sometimes a, a good workout is good enough. It, they're not all going to be amazing, and that's fine. Like it's as long as you're conveying a really c concise, clear message for for your audience, your listeners. The rest of it could be edited. Everything else could be cleaned up. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the, In that gym metaphor, I think about um, like the personal trainer as the videographer, like kind of becomes my metaphor. But I'm like, well, what the what the personal trainer brings to the table is the insight. He knows the workouts, right? But if you knew the workouts and you had all of the equipment and you had the gym membership and it all came at the same cost, if you were also a certified personal trainer and you were a highly motivated person, in other words, if there were no difference that that personal trainer could bring to the table for your workout, would you pay the extra 250 bucks, you know, every session or whatever it is to have them around? Or would you say, you know what, they're Roscoe, I think I got this. I'm just kidding. I don't want to hate on <laughs> <laughs> Don't hate on Roscoe's. You know, it's really funny. So in my 20s, I actually... Um, I worked through my dad's machine shop, decided to leave, got my certification to be a personal trainer, started working in gyms. Fast forward a handful of years, I built out a gym at my house. I work out religiously all the time. I, for the most part, I'm pretty, I'm pretty disciplined and I'm pretty driven. However, here's the big caveat. My good friend Clint is the one who I will text and be like, hey man, I need help with my program. Hey man, I'm having trouble like with my eating schedule or, Hey, I screwed up my shoulder. What do you recommend? So even though I have this, this body of knowledge, I still lean on another expert to, to kind of guide me through. And so and you I, tap into it when, when need be right. Obviously the it. friendship is there not to say, I don't want that to be like, oh, I'll call him when I need him. Like, you know, well, that is, yeah. what but on, yeah, like, on a, on a service related level, he, has things to offer that are situational. And it's uh, maybe a higher level of understanding in things that you are exactly. already super capable. Yeah, and he, like, I, like sometimes it's like quick, like, hey, like, hey man, this is actually really irritating me. Do you have a workaround? And he'll just like text me something quick. But other times I'm like, hey dude, book me for an hour. And I actually pay him for his services and for his time because he's super, super knowledgeable. And he'll run through and look at my form or look at what I'm doing or answer a bunch of questions for me. And yeah. it's sometimes really good to, to relate it to content marketing. If you're creating this stuff and you're putting it out, sometimes it's good to just have somebody look at it and say, hey, you know, make some tweaks over here or maybe go a little bit deeper over here or have them look at your analytics with you and say, hey, 
actually this thing when you talk about it you tend to get more trends so go back and talk more about this stuff sometimes you just need another another set of eyeballs to go back we are our brand and sometimes you can't you just can't see for yourself where a coach can see it for you Mm -hmm. so that's my my two cents on that you're absolutely right i would add to that that in the world of content marketing if you're in a position where you can't for whatever reason or won't or don't want to hire a professional so to speak like a coach or the trainer in this sure. metaphor um you are still absolutely a focus group of one trying to judge yourself in your own content so even if you don't go as far as to take a piece of content or your channel as a whole and reach out to a content marketing specialist and ask for an audit and a consultation, et cetera, et cetera. Just the act of showing it to a friend, to a family member, to a colleague, to anybody that knows you, gets you, somebody that maybe is in the industry, maybe they aren't because it doesn't really matter their relationship to the workspace, they're just giving you feedback on how you present yourself. I I guess what I'm saying is in the world of trainer, absolutely. You're not just going to reach out to anybody and say, Hey, I had a snag with my nutrition, or I think there's something off in my programming. Can you help me out? You know, your, your beer belly neighbor is going to look at you and be like, no dude, absolutely. On the other hand, if you are not sure about a video and you walk up to that same beer belly neighbor who clearly isn't the guy to help you grab, put your six pack together before the 4th of July and you say, what do you think of this video? He'll tell you something yeah. worth taking away, you know, and sure. don't take it, don't take it to heart, take it with a grain of salt, you know, but uh, he'll give you something to take away with. So look, just a little bit of a caveat there that I thought was worth exploring, right? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's funny. It reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever heard the quote, a lion doesn't take advice from the sheep. And like, I personally, if I'm going to seek advice, I I would want to seek it from the person who is, one, they're going to give me something constructive to work with. And they're they're either the ideal person I'm trying to reach or they're an expert in that category. So mm-hmm. my, my asterisk with that is be careful who you ask. Oh, because... of course. And that's why I say take it with a grain of salt. Don't, exactly. you know, like, but, but with regard to the, the content marketing thing, all too often, especially if it's personal brand oriented, it can become a bit of a bubble. And that's dangerous. Yes. It's, it's Truthfully, it's dangerous for your mental health and for everyone around you. And as a result, it's inherently dangerous for your brand and your business to just live in this silo of what I think people want to see or how I think I should be acting in content. So um, your asterisks, well-deserved for sure, for sure. (laughs) But I just thought that that was an interesting kind of nuance to approach there was like, you know what? I, w- I would ask the person who is absolutely not an expert, um, sheerly for the basis of it's doing something other than asking myself. Yeah, yeah, you got to sometimes just get out of your own way and and kind of absorb what a, how it's being perceived mm-hmm. um, for good or bad. S- dude, Steve, this totally railed by. We stayed more on the the basic beginner aspect of it. I, at some point would love to have you come back on because I want to go way deeper in a lot more of these categories. And I feel like we just barely scratched the surface on helping people getting started, but can go way deeper for that, that agent who's doing it, but now just really wants to go hard on the paint and take it to like the next, next level. Yeah, yeah. Um, it would, so uh, it would be an honor mind. and a pleasure. I'll, I'll do my best to have my microphone in order by then. Now, what do you, th- what do you think uh, you would want to dig deeper into? Like, what, uh, what, what would you say would be uh, worth unpacking for the, the 2.0 version? <laughs> uh, that's a really great question. I mean, I think I don't have something specific in my mind, but I do feel like there's a lot of the – there's a lot more nuance to – all of this that I would love to to dive into of the nuance of 
identifying your ideal audience and oh yeah sure and even identifying you know what is the goal people and i would say this is a big mis misconception that takes a lot more conversation but oftentimes people think you post on social for leads and that's not how it works it's posting for conversations and those conversations lead to the next step which leads to the next step which leads to the potential for a lead and so just diving into all of those the nuances and the expectations that people have around these things as well as the realistic timelines of well i posted a video and and xyz didn't happen and you're like all right we'll keep going but really diving into all of those pieces yeah absolutely that's um we'd be happy to unpack any and all of that with you and whatever else you might uh deem worthy between now and then but no i think this is uh it's good this kind of set the tone for for that next conversation and um yeah look forward to unpacking it with you cool man well we'll put a pin in it and uh we'll have you back on so steve i really i genuinely appreciate your time my absolute pleasure brother. appreciate you having me and uh until next time i'll um i'll complete uh that form i have uh some details to get over to you still i haven't done my homework properly as a uh podcast guest so i'll throw myself under the bus quickly and say i owe you a couple of things I'll get them right to you, and um, I appreciate the opportunity as always. It's been great chatting with you, and um, we'll circle back uh, in between to figure out what we do next. Sounds good. Till next time. All right. Sounds good. Cheers.